Elaine, can you hear me? Hi, Takis. This is Tracy, and I can hear you. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. Bye bye. Hi, Tracy, and this is um, Glenn testing, testing, testing. Hi, Member Hendricks. Your mic sounds great. Okay, awesome. Oh, my mic sounds good. I don't. Got oh, it. You, you do too. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just a second. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Maria, can we do a quick mic check, please? Maria Chavez. We can't hear you. Okay, now it says it's connecting to audio. We can't hear you. Um, I can text you um, the call in if that's helpful. Let's try that again. It looks like it says check. Maria? Hello, can you hear me? Yay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes it's a technology delay. Yeah. Good afternoon. Hello, Chair. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Hello, member Paul. We can hear you well. Thank you. Great. Thank you.
Sorry, Elaine, I should have tried. Am I okay? That was Greg, I'm by the perfect. way. Okay. <laughs> I see you searching around. Thanks. Greg, you have one of those good DJ voices. Right. That'll be the last job that I do when I'm... I hear that a lot. I've just never taken up on it. One of these days. Not a DJ, just voiceover. Oh, there you go. Elaine, just let me know when we have a quorum. Yes, sir. All right, can we do a quick mic check for uh, Vice Chair Constantine, please? Hello. Hello. Um, what about Board Member Perales? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Board Member Jane? I see. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm thank here. you. And Board Member Burt? Board member Burke, can we do a quick mic check, please? Oh, sorry, I'm here as well. Thank you. Sorry. Recording in progress. Chair, we have a quorum already, so we can get started whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the VTA Board of Directors regular meeting of Thursday, April 7th, 2022, is called to order. Elaine, can we have a roll call, please? Abby Koga? Here. Blankley? Bert? Here. Carrasco? Chavez? Davis? Hendricks? Attending. Jane? Here. Jimenez? Lee? Lee Ng? Here. Ricardo? Montano? Hall? Here. Perales? Here. Rennie? Constantine? Present. Jones? Present. We have a quorum chair. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item. 1.2 orders of the day. We will adjourn tonight's meeting in memory of former VTA safety manager, Denise Joy Patrick. Denise passed away on Saturday, April 2nd. Denise was hired in 1995. She worked her way up through the ranks from a bus operator to safety manager. She was well-respected and liked by her colleagues. Uh, Denise retired from VTA in 2019 after 24 years of service. Denise is survived by her daughter, Selena, sisters Donna and Heather, stepmother Liz, and her husband, Mike. Our sincere, uh, sincerest condolences go out to Denise's family and friends. I would uh, like to ask for a moment of silence in honor and memory of Denise Joy Patrick. Thank you. Uh, I, want, I want to remind everyone that closed session will be held immediately following the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any changes from my colleagues? Okay. Now I wanna move on to uh, um, item 2.1. And that is our uh, awards and commendations. And item 2.1 is to adopt the resolution of appreciation for outgoing board member, Joe Samidian. First, may I have a motion and a second, please? So moved, this is Glenn. Second, Constantine. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Elaine, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Chair Burt. Here. Burt. Yes. Carrasco. Carrasco is absent. Chavez. Constantine. Aye. Hendricks. Yes. Jane. Yes. Jimenez. Jones. Aye. Lee. Licardo. Aye. Paul. Yes. Corrales. Yes. I'm going to come back to Carrasco, Chavez, and uh, Jimenez. Motion passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joe couldn't be here tonight. I want to highlight a few things in the resolution. Whereas Joe Samidian led the effort to finalize the 2016. Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, Joe couldn't be here tonight. I wanted to highlight a few things in the resolution. Whereas Joe Samidian led the effort to finalize the 2016 Measure B spending plan, including the comprehensive 10 year program, the prioritized project list for the highway interchange competitive grant program, and the allocation of funding to the Caltrain grade separation program. And whereas Joe Samidian demonstrated compassion and concern for the well being of VTA's employees and their families, came to define VTA's response to mass shooting in May 2021. And whereas Joe Samidian focused attention on VTA's role as the county's congestion management agency, including the importance of congestion management being part of the identified goals in VTA's business plan. Whereas Joseph Median championed expansion of the Reach Your Destination Easily program into San Jose and Morgan Hill, thereby expanding the program the county initiated with VTA in the cities of Los Gatos, Monterino, Saratoga, Cupertino, and Campbell in 2017 to provide curb to curb transportation and local trip planning services for adults age 55 and older. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the VTA Board of Directors hereby commends and expresses his sincerest appreciation to Joe Samidian for his exemplary public service as a member of VTA Board of Directors for 2021, and be it further resolved that this resolution is presented with the thanks and good wishes of VTA. Adopted by the VTA Board of Directors the seventh day of April, 2022. Congratulations, Joe, if you can hear us out there. Okay, on to item 2.2 is to adopt the resolution of appreciation for outgoing alternative board member Lisa Gilmore. First, might I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. This is Glenn. Second, second Constantine. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Elaine? Bert? Yes. Carrasco? I'll come back to you because I see your name. Chavez? Constantine? Aye. Hendrix? Yes. Jane? Yes. Jimenez? Jones? Aye. Lee? Ricardo? Aye. Paul? Yes. Perales? Yes. I'll come back to Carrasco. Jimenez and Lee? All right, they are absent. Motion passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now read the abbreviated version of the resolution. The full text is in the packet. Whereas Lisa Gilmore served as an alter alternate member in 2021, representing the North East Cities group, including the city of Santa Clara. And whereas Lisa Gilmore represented VTA and the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority, and her contributions enabled the advancement of many improvements and expansions for the Capital Corridor. And whereas Lisa Gilmore demonstrated compassion and concern for the well being of VTA's employees and their families, came to define VTA's response to mass shooting in May 2021. And therefore, be it resolved that the VTA Board of Governors 
hereby commends and expresses its sincerest appreciation to Lisa Gilmore for her exemplary public service and contributions to VTA and to transit in Santa Clara County. And be it further resolved that this resolution is presented with the thanks and good wishes of VTA. Adopted by the VTA Board of Directors the seventh day of April, 2022. Congratulations, Lisa, if you can hear us. Next on our agenda is item three, public comment. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons desiring to address the Board of Directors on any item within the Board's jurisdiction, but not on the agenda. Speakers will have one minute to speak. As noted on our agenda, we will have up to 30 minutes for the public comments on items not on the agenda. Those who requested to speak but were unable to address the board on item three due to the time limit will have the opportunity to address the board on the second public comment under other items. The law does not permit board action or extended discussion of any item not on the agenda except under special circumstances. Those with customer service concerns are encouraged to contact our customer service department after you make your comments. Their contact information is on the screen. Before Talia calls our speakers, I would like to remind the members of the public who are speaking tonight to adhere to our rules when addressing the board. They are on the public speaker timer slide you will see on the screen. First, direct your comments to the board and not to any specific person or group. Personal attacks are not appropriate and using slanderous or profane remarks is prohibited. Making threats, inciting violence, or disrupting the meeting is not allowed. Speakers who make such remarks or anyone who disrupts the meeting will not be allowed to complete their time to speak and or be removed from the meeting. If you want to address the board on matters not on the agenda, please raise your hand now by using the app or press star nine on your phone. We will now start public comments. Talia? Thank you. We have one hand. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. All right, Blair Beekman here. Happy April meeting to everyone. Uh, thanks to Council, uh, to uh, Chairperson Jones. I think he read the clarification statement very well. It was a nice way he read that. Um, I wanted to speak on the previous item. Uh, I'll speak on this one. Uh, uh, former Chair uh, Person Jones, uh, Supervisor Jones, uh, he he's done a lot. He he helped create the Surveillance and Technology Ordinance, brought that to Santa Clara County in San Jose or Santa Clara County in 2016. Uh, the ideas of closed circuit camera technology, open public policies. We've been doing that to this day. Uh, it's an important time, you know, he's done really amazing work with that. It's an important time with biometric cameras and their connections with the future of, uh, you know, vaccine process, how we can continue an open public policy conversation and dialogue that allows us that. Good luck in how we can work on these things. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, more speakers. Our next speaker is Ron. You may begin speaking when ready. Uh, my name is Ron Langston. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Ron Langston. I'm a coach operator. I've been a coach operator for 42 years, eight months, and 28 days. I absolutely love my job. I'm on the JATC board, which oversees JWI, which I've been a mentor since the inclusion of since 2007. Uh, I have an excellent attendance record. I've been 40 years of safe driving. I have received a letter saying that I am subject to termination if I am unvaccinated on April 29th, 2022. I have been tested. All my tests have been negative. I'm asking the board if they can look into reviewing the policy of the vaccine or possibly going to uh, testing. Thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Augustine. You may begin speaking when ready. Why are your unvaccinated employees no longer considered heroes and essential to this company and the public? After working throughout 2020 without a vaccine and risking our lives, as well as being affected by last year's shooting, is this how you reward us? 
many of you were working from home behind a screen. Why have you waited so long to come out with this coercive and unethical policy? If this is not a discriminatory policy, why is it that employees who were vaccinated 8, 10, 12 plus months ago will not be terminated from their job? I'm sure we can all agree that vaccines wane rather quickly. They might as well be considered unvaccinated since they also cannot maintain a healthy and safe work environment. Why won't you consider the protection from previous infection? Vaccines are not the only way to develop protection. I took an antibody test at Kaiser and still had antibodies in my blood 13 months post-infection. Can you say the same for the vaccine that will last 13 months without it waning? Please consider reversing this policy and may logic and reason prevail. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Uh, we will now go on to item four, and we don't have any items under four, so we'll move on to committee reports. Moving on to item 5.1, committee reports, a reminder for the public. We will take public comments for items under this section at the conclusion of the reports. For item 5.1.A, Citizens Advisory Committee Vice Chairperson Howard Miller is here to provide a brief report. Thank you, Chair Jones. And uh, thank you to uh, the honorable members of the BTA board uh, and staff. My brief report tonight is in two parts. First, as you know, the Citizens Advisory um, Committee is uh, undergoing a metamorphosis. Some uh, longstanding members have moved on and we've put in place some new members. And with that, staff prepared an exceptional um, mini workshop not as extensive as a board workshop, but pretty big for a, for a committee uh, to help bring up our new committee members, um, bring them up to speed on, you know, shoot the vernacular of ETA, what this committee really does, what are our obligations under Measure A, and then we had a series of reports from the staff, key staff members in key areas that helped us better understand how Measure A turns into projects within VTA. Following that mini workshop, uh, we had our regularly scheduled meeting. And the big news from this meeting is we have uh, set the public hearing date for our official uh, audit for Measure A. And that public hearing will be on uh, May 11th at 6 p.m., which is a Wednesday, will be held via Zoom. There is no in-person for us yet. Um, and we are encouraging you and any member of the public that's listening tonight uh, to try to attend that meeting. You'll find out our review of uh, how we felt VTA did in adhering to the, the letter of the law and the intent of Measure A in the last year. That concludes my report. I'm available if there are any questions. Thank you, Howard, and it's good seeing you. Yeah. Have a good night, you guys. Take care. All right, next is item 5.1. Point B, Policy Advisory Committee, uh, Chairperson's Report. And for this item, Chairperson Kitty Moore is here to provide a brief report. Kitty? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Jones. Okay, so the Policy Advisory Committee on Thursday, March 10th, 2022, we received a presentation from VTA General Manager and CEO Carolyn Gannott on plans to stabilize and revitalize our organization, referred to as the VTA Forward Plan and a recent tour of VTA facilities with Congressman Khanna. We received a presentation on the bipartisan infrastructure law and grant opportunities for local jurisdictions. The committee inquired about ways smaller cities can become more familiar with these programs and possible partnerships between cities and coordination on the development of projects. We recommended the reprogramming of $3.239 million in one Bay Area grant cycle two congestion mitigation air quality federal funds to the Cupertino Stevens Creek Boulevard class four bikeway and the Los Gatos Los Gatos Creek Trail to Highway 9 trailhead connector. The committee also recommended that any additional OBAG cycle two funds, if relinquished in the future, should be dedicated to the Los Gatos Los Gatos Creek Trail to Highway 9 trailhead connector. Lastly, we recommended the VTA Board of Directors adopt the 2021 Priority Development Area Investment and Growth Strategy 2000 Measure A Transit Improvement Program Semi-Annual Report 
the Valley Transportation Plan semi-annual report and the fiscal year 2022 second quarter transit operations performance report. The upcoming PAC meeting scheduled for Thursday, April 14th, 2022 has been canceled. The committee will next meet on May 12th, 2022. And I have a special report on April 2nd, VTA Caltrans in the city of Cupertino. In particular, our VTA uh, board member, Mayor Paul, coordinated an I-280 cleanup at the De Anza Boulevard exit. Uh, this had the entire Cupertino City Council, which includes myself, our planning commission chair, and vice chair, along with other community volunteers who all spoke very highly of the event, and we hope to have more of these in the future. Thank you to VTA board member Paul and the VTA for coordinating with Caltrans for this event. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Now for item 5.1.C, the standing committee chairperson's reports are on the online agenda packet uh, for Item 5.1.D, the East Ridge to BART Regional Connector Policy Advisory Board Chairperson's Report is in the online agenda packet. Uh, we will now take public comments for all items under committee reports. Talia, do we have any public speakers? Yes, Chair, we have one hand raised. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for this item. Uh, about the PAC issues, uh, in a further compliments to the work of uh, Supervisor Semidian uh, and his work with uh, openness and accountability with the future of technology, the many projects that this PAC item talked about, it's going to need uh, <coughs> uh, surveillance technology and data collection involved with it as well. And Semidian's work on open public policies and accountability with technology is unparalleled, basically, and what can be of help for this sort of item. And it, uh, you know, the future that we can build uh, uh, of openness and accountability it, it, and open democracy, civil protection ideas, it is the idea is basically um, how we can better organize ourselves and, and, and create more efficient good practices. So good luck in these efforts. What you can do building open democracy is, is interesting good work. And, and thanks for submitting and, and this item and, and uh, all our efforts. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay, comments uh, for item 5.1 is now closed. That takes us to item 5.2, general manager report. Carolyn? Great, just a minute. Um, thank you, just a minute. <laughs> We'll make sure I hear it. Um, I just want to give you a brief report on some of the activity over the last few weeks. Um, the VTA Transit Driver Appreciation Day was March 18th, and we thank board member and county supervisor Otto Lee for presenting us with a proclamation for that event. And our operations division put together hundreds of goodie bags to hand out to the operators as they came to work that day. And we received dozens of comments through customer service and on social media thanking our drivers for their service. Um, the next item is the local road safety plan, and in collaboration with the local cities within Santa Clara County, VTA is developing a countywide local road safety plan to provide the framework to analyze and prioritize safety improvements on our local roads for all modes, especially the pedestrians and bicyclists. And residents can participate by reporting areas of concern in their respective communities online. Um, for example, a street corner in need of a stop sign, an intersection where far too many close calls are happening, or a neighborhood roadway that sees multiple car accidents per month. These are all examples of where residents can help city staff with making safer neighborhoods. The safety plan will enable local cities eligible to apply for state and federal grants like Caltrans Highway Safety Improvement Program, which awarded over $200 million in 2021 for statewide traffic safety improvements. Um, we did receive positive news coverage on this local safety road safety plan. Um, and after the first report on KTVU, we received an additional 195 responses to the survey, which allowed residents to identify those trouble spots in their neighborhood. And that survey is going to run until April 22nd. And we encourage more participation by going to the VTA website. Um, the next item is that VTA is celebrating our 10th anniversary of State Route 237 Express Lanes. And they opened in March of 2012. 
um, from the first day, the lanes are bringing in revenue that we can reinvest in the system. Um, vehicles are seeing a travel time savings of up to 14 minutes on that stretch of 880 and 237. Um, and I can tell you, I've taken it myself and have saved like up to 20 minutes on that inner, on, on that piece of roadway. Um, this first segment allowed us to continue to grow our system with the recently opened express lanes on Highway 85 and 101. Um, the next slide is the highway cleanup event, which actually uh, Council Member Kitty Moore just mentioned. Um, and uh, she mentioned uh, that the event that we held in uh, Cupertino. Um, there are some of these photos of the cleanup event that took place last Saturday. And this is part of the campaign that we're involved in. It's called Keep Santa Clara Valley Beautiful. <coughs> um, VTA is partnering with Caltrans and a few other agencies in this cleanup effort in various locations around Santa Clara County. And actually, if you look carefully, you can see VTA board member um, and Cupertino Mayor Darcy Paul in the center photo on the far left. Uh, I wanna thank uh, member Paul, board member Paul for joining in this effort. Our next item is about the Alliance for Girls initiative and update. I'm excited that we are moving forward with the Alliance for Girls on an initiative to ensure women and girls not only are safe on our system, but most importantly, that they feel safe and protected when they ride VTA. We are about to partner with this nonprofit group to see how we can work with community organizations in Santa Clara County to better ensure the safety of women and girls on our system. And I expect to have more details, including a resolution for our board to consider this summer. And um, now, I wanna take a moment to pay tribute, long overdue and for our board to pay tribute to some of the VTA employees who helped to keep our service running in the wake of the crippling events of May 26th. The rail controllers and the transit radio dispatchers are the employees who communicate with our bus and light rail operators and other staff in the field. When the attack happened on May 26th, these employees continued to show up every day thereafter to ensure a large segment of our community, many of them essential workers themselves, that they had access to the service they rely on. They also kept our rail and bus system safe. And even though it's been many months since the tragedy at Guadalupe, I wanna pay a public tribute to these employees and thank them for their steadfast dedication to their jobs, to VTA and to our community. And like to round of applause for them, even if it's silent. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, and then um, the next slide is actually recognizing Abrar Ahmad, who actually is the superintendent for this area. And I'd like to recognize him as one of our recent retirees. Um, Abrar retired from VTA last Friday after 32 years of service. He started with VTA in 1980 as a bus operator, working his way up to transportation superintendent of service management and the operations control center. Many employees looked up to Abrar and admired him. He was a great team player and a leader who always helped VTA achieve its goals. The photo you see here expresses his great love of the sport of cricket. He was instrumental in developing local cricket leagues in the Bay Area, and I bet he will continue to be involved now that he has a little more time to spend doing that. Abrar, thank you so much for your hard work and dedication in the last three de decades. We will miss working with you, and we wish you the very best in your retirement as well. Um, thank you, and that concludes... Um, that's this portion of my uh, report on 5.2.8 um, for government affairs update. Uh, this is in included in your packet. Um, so are the ridership safety and security statistics. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we'll now take public comments for this item. A reminder, please focus your comments only on the GM report. Taya. Do we have public comments? Yes, we have two, I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. First will be Michaela followed by Blair. Michaela, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, my name's Michaela. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. My name's Michaela and I would like to ask the board, you just recognized my ATU brothers and sisters and AFSCME brother and sisters who continued working. I was wondering, um, how the board chose who was able to get trauma leave when the incident happened and who got to spend the summer with their families, but ignored these people that you just honored. I was just wondering how that decision was made because I'm sorry, my husband can't sleep at night. He doesn't have access to a counselor. 
and you guys continue to ignore their families and how important it is to heal. So I was just wondering how you decided that this little blip was enough. Thank it's actually quite there. rude. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair B. Quinn here. I usually save this public comment for uh, closed agenda matter items that, that you discuss uh, in the victims of, of last May. But maybe it can be a hopeful time to remind, uh, you know, that the work I am doing with openness, public policies and accountability with technology, it, it, it's, it can be incredibly hopeful. And for the people of victims who feel like there's nowhere to turn and life is terrible or government is terrible, these sort of practices, I think, really help bring an important light of what is possible for our future. And that, you know, it is a future we can work towards sustainability and peace and open democracy, really interesting subjects. There is hope for our future. If you need a place to look for things for hope, uh, take a look at this stuff, it's really good work. And a quick reminder that uh, the city of Davis has really good uh, technology, open public policies with their trails and, and, and such that can be of help for the previous item. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes public comment. Okay, public comment for item 5.2 is now closed. Are there any questions from my colleagues for the general manager? And I don't see any hands raised. So the next item is item 5.3, the chairperson's report. For my report, I would like to announce that they, we are actively recruiting for the Transportation Mobility and Accessibility Advisory Committee. This committee provides guidance and perspective to the board on BTA transit and transportation accessibility matters to help ensure access to all users in Santa Clara County. They facilitate and advocate for the transportation needs of the disabled and senior communities. I would like to ask my colleagues to reach out to your contacts in the senior and disabled community to find candidates who would like to be, or who are interested in serving on this important committee. The committee has nine vacancies and they have had challenges meeting a quorum for quite some time now. That concludes my report. We will now take public comment for the chair's report. Talia? There are no hands raised. Oh, All right. We just Blair. had a hand go up. I'm sorry. No worries. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, like I've tried to mention a few times now over the in the era of COVID, uh, making the cleaning practices uh, more open and available and understandable to everyday public uh, was an interesting idea that we were working on. Uh, you know, how, how can paratransit vehicles be cleaner and, and what sort of scheduling do they have? Point of order, Mr. Chair. I don't believe that these comments are relevant to your report. I agree. Well, Sorry, I Blair. feel it has a certain uh, openness about accessibility issues that we can always want to talk about paratransit issues, but I will close now. And Thank you. Uh, public comment uh, for item 5.3 is now closed. That takes us to item 6.0, consent agenda. Item 6.1 through 6.17. Members of the public who would like to address the board on an item on consent, please raise your hand now on the app or press star nine on your phone. To my colleagues, is there anyone who wants to pull an item off consent or add an item to the consent agenda? And I see Director Licardo, you have your hand raised. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, would like to recuse myself from two items, item 6.2 and 6.3 under government code section 84308. And then I had a question on 6.7 whenever that time's appropriate. Okay. Uh, Director Perales. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to also recuse myself, uh, but just from item 6.3 under government code 84308. Okay. Are there any other uh, abstentions or recusals? If 
Okay, I see none. Uh, so we are now open it up for uh, public comment on consent. Taya? Yes, we have one hand raised. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I feel Chairman Hendricks uh, misjudged my uh, public comment, uh, the relevancy of it. I think it had a certain uh, relevancy about uh, accessibility issues. It's something we can consider after the session, of course. Uh, item 6.3, I mean, that is my point to make things open, friendly, and accessible. I, I don't think, uh, I think things can be relevant in those terms often. Uh, item 6.3, can the ideas of mixed income offer a flexibility to the future of the Mid-Peninsula Transit-Oriented Housing Project? I feel this can relate to item 6.4 and what should be the overall need that the Bay Area can respect and want to better work with the study session process on mixed income ideas that is taking place in many other major metropolitan areas in the state of California at this time. Thank you. That concludes okay. public comment. All right, thank you. Um, that closes public comment on consent. Uh, before I entertain a motion, uh, Director Licardo, you had a question or comment on item 6.7. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, 6.7, I believe, is the OPAG uh, competitive application funding. I want to thank uh, staff, appreciate uh, the commitments to the projects you've identified, and certainly in the city of San Jose, where we've had 23 uh, traffic related fatalities just since the beginning of the year, uh, particularly those investments at McKee and Tolly are super important. I just had a question about how dollars were allocated for those. Um, projects that missed the cutoff under the competitive uh, process. And in, just from the report, it suggested that staff basically called up all the cities and said, who, who's interested? And it sounds like only a couple of cities were. And I'm just trying to understand better because I would assume that all the cities would say, we're all interested because we'd all love to have the money. Could, could you just help me understand better how the cutoff, the, the, the money was allocated for those, those projects that didn't make the cutoff? Uh, Chair, I'd be uh, happy to start the answer to the question. And we also have Celeste Fiore, our transportation planner that led this effort. Um, so, so Mayor, um, one important point as we called the cities is that because of the length of time remaining on this grant, they also had to be able to commit to delivering the project in a very short period of time. But um, I'd like to ask, I think Celeste has been unmuted and she can give you um, more accurate details. I don't see Celeste on here yet. I know Marcella is. Uh, Celeste is actually, this is- Oh, Elena there she is now. Me. Okay, there Celeste, she is. Thank please you. begin speaking whenever you're ready. I'm just testing to make sure you can hear me. I'm seeing the unmute button come up a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Mayor Licardo, when we uh, go through this process, we, and we've gone through it several times uh, because this has happened more than once at the end of OBAG 2, we do look at the cutoff and we went to each and every jurisdiction below the cutoff line and requested that they respond to us, letting us know they were interested in those funds. And in each incident we had, uh, the prior one was uh, San Jose, Camel, uh, Campbell and Mountain View. Went through the process again, we've sent out several emails. Uh, I reach out to the CIP working group because I'm staff liaison. And that was all that we had at that time. We've had this second situation come up that you have on agenda 6.7, went through the entire process again, top to bottom, every agency below the cutoff line. And we had Cupertino who responded to it. Um, and we had an, a, an additional funds still remaining to program. And right. we were aware that Los Gatos was already in the tip and working on their project. So we approached them. And, and I appreciate that, Celeste, and, and, and believe me, I don't mean to disparage Cupertino because uh, good for them, they stepped up and I'm sure it's a good project. The, the question I had was, why it was that every city wouldn't say, of course we want this money, we applied originally. Deborah suggested there may have been a time, um, an urgency around uh, a time commitment because of the source of the funding, is that, is that it? That is part of it. Some of the uh, some of the agencies said that they just didn't uh, it, they weren't prepared um, for the project to move forward at this time because there's been a lag since we originally uh, had the program of projects approved. 
until 2022. So I'm sure that some of the agencies had moved on. Cupertino had actually moved on and started work on their project without the funding. And the other point being is that uh, there is a time frame for these funds to be obligated, which means they have to secure their a request for authorization from Caltrans, and that's in January of 2023, which backtracks back to Caltrans has to approve that. Some, the packets have to be in to Caltrans and they start approving them in November, which is really their high season to approve these pack, uh, packages. So basically uh, all the agencies were either didn't respond or said they weren't prepared. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. So uh, I want to entertain a motion uh, for this item uh, with uh, Director Ricardo recusing himself from item 6.2 and 6.3 and Director Perales recusing himself from 6.3. So, so moved here. Constantine. Second. James. All right. Um, I heard a motion from Constantine and a, and a second from Director Jane, I believe. So Elaine, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, just to confirm, this is for the consent agenda, item 6.1 through 6.17. Bert? Yes. Carrasco? Chavez? Constantine? Aye. Hendrix? Yes. Jane? Yes. Jimenez? Jones? Aye. Lee? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. With a recusal for 6.2 and 6.3. Thank you. Paul? Yes. Corrales? Yes. With a recusal for 6.3. Motion passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to item seven, closed session. We'll be discussing closed session item 7.1.A and 7.1.B. Before we recess to closed session, are there any members of the public who would like to address the board relating to items 7.1.A and 7.1.B? Yes, Chair, we have one hand raised. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hello, Blair Beekman here. Uh, a quick, a quick idea that I, uh, I've mentioned a few times at, as you're having closed sessions at in the middle of the meeting, it, can it be easier to make clear exactly how long we can expect the meeting to be as a person from the public? So like, can you offer, uh, we'll see you again in possibly a half hour to 45 minutes or possibly 45 minutes to an hour. To offer a few words like that can give the public a sense of when they can know, can be safe to return to the process and, and, and know when uh, things can be available. And I just wanted to mention that again. I think it's something I'll try to uh, continually ask until I can, uh, until it's figured out what's, what's, uh, if it's if it is a good thing to do or not and all that good stuff so hopefully you can work on it it could be an acceptable way to work thank you and that concludes public comment thank you uh we will now close public comment for item 7.1.a and 7.1.b board members the closed session teams link is in the calendar invite sent to you by the board office Please click that link or call in. Please mute your Zoom microphone and turn off your video during closed session. Do not leave or log off your Zoom so you can return to open meeting after our closed session. We will now go to closed session and we will be back in about an hour. See you in closed session. Recording stopped.
So Elaine, let us know and we can start back up. Recording in progress. Chair, sorry for the delay. We were just having a little bit of technical issues. Let me okay. just count real quick. Chair, I believe we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. We're now back to open session. Uh, Evelyn uh, will provide us with a closed session report. Thank you, Chair. The board did not take any reportable actions in closed session this evening. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't see any raised hands for the closed session report. So that takes us to the regular agenda. First on the regular agenda is item 8.1, which is to approve and formally adopt a successor labor agreement negotiated between Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 101. Jay Bailey, Interim Chief of People Resources, will provide the report. Jay? Thank you, Chair Jones, board members. Um, as the chair stated, we are asking approval and formal adoption of the successor labor agreement for AFSME. Um, this is the third of four labor agreements that we are bringing before the board. The fourth one is also the next agenda item. This is... Um, Again, a contract extension, which will take the collective bargaining agreement, which, which expires this spring between BTA and AFSCME, will extend it for a three-year term from April 4th, 2022 to April 3rd, 2025. Um, we'll have a wage adjustment similar to the other two, or exactly the same as the other two agreements that we have already approved of 2%, 4%, and 4% spread out over three years. And we'll also provide appreciation pay of $3,500 to be paid to all AFSCME members no later than April 29th of this year. Next slide. In these negotiated uh, provisions, we've already said that it will, what the dates of the, um, what the pays, what the pay will be. AFSCME ratified this agreement on March 17th, and we thank their leadership very much for all of the diligence in, in, in meeting with us and, and getting this done and then in guiding it through their ratification process. The estimated fiscal impact for this agreement is $7.698 million for the term of the contract, and the estimated impact of the appreciation pay is $905,000. Next slide. We have included here in our presentation the wage increase impacts on a 10-year projection, and my colleague uh, Greg Richardson, our CFO, is also here if the board has any questions on it. Um, as, as with the other collective bargaining agreements that we've already brought before the board this year, all other provisions of this agreement will remain in effect for this three-year term, and it will only be these provisions that change. That ends my presentation, and we can entertain any questions. Uh, thank you, Jay. Look We'll now take public comment. Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? There are no hands raised. All right, we'll now close public comment for this item. Are there any questions from my colleagues? And I don't see any hands raised. Um, may I have a motion in a second, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I. 
Yes, Chair, this oh. is Elaine. I just wanted to note for the record that board member Chavez is joining us by phone and she's phone number ending in um, 790. Great. And then Thank also, you, Elaine. And then also Director Ricardo has his hand raised. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to indicate uh, my dissent for the same reasons I expressed on uh, the prior contract vote. I, I think we ought to be uh, working out a way to address these these ongoing operating deficits uh, with in, in cooperation with our, our employees um, before we we step forward uh, with these longer term commitments, the three year commitment. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see other hands raised. Can I get a motion and a second, please? Move to approve, Chair. Second by Jane. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Elaine, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. This is for item 8.1. Bert? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Chavez? Yes. Constantine? Aye. Hendrix? Yes. Jane? Yes. Jimenez, Jones, Aye. Lee, Aye. Ricardo, no. Paul, yes. Perales, yes. Motion passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next is item 8.2, which is to approve and formally adopt a successor labor agreement negotiated between Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and Transportation Authority Engineers and Architects Association, Local 21. Jay Bailey will provide the report. Thank you again, Chair. This is the last of our collective bargaining agreements because we do have four bargaining units at, at uh, VTA. So this is the last of the agreements. As with the others, this followed the same path of negotiations, which was a bit of a um, reduced negotiation. So all Provisions of the current collective bargaining agreement, which expires this spring, will remain in effect except for the items that you see on your screen there. It will be for a three-year term, as, with, as are the others, from April 4th, 2022 to April 3rd, 2025. The same wage adjustments apply to this contract, 2%, 4%, and 4%, and appreciation pay of $3,500 to be paid to all TAEA members no later than April 29th. Next slide. TAEA ratified this agreement on April 4th, 2022. Again, we want to thank the union leadership from this bargaining unit for all of their work and coming to the table and working this out with us, um, and also for their leadership and guiding us through their ratification process. The estimated fiscal impact for this agreement is 1.372 million for the term of the contract for the wages, and the estimated impact of the appreciation pay is $112,000. Next slide. This is the same 10-year projection uh, wage increase impacts that we've shown before. Um, with that, I'll end my presentation and take any questions. Uh, thank, thank you again, Jay. Uh, we will now take public comment. There are no hands raised, Chair. Okay, we will now close public comment for this item. And I uh, see Director Licardo has his hand raised, I'm assuming. To make the uh, no, nope, sorry, that was from before. My apologies. Okay. All right. Uh, so, it, can I get a motion in a second, please, on the side? Jane moves to approve. Second, Constantine. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Elaine, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes, Chair. Um, this is for item eight point two. Bert. Yes. Carrasco. Aye. Thank you, Chavez. Yes. Constantine? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Aye. Constantine, thank you. You're welcome. Hendrix? Yes. Jane? Yes. Jimenez? Jones? Aye. Lee? Aye. Ricardo? No. Paul? Yes. Perales? Yes. Uh, motion passed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 8.3, which is to adopt a resolution for the provision of alternative pre-retirement death benefits to the families of the victims who lost their lives due to the May 26, 2021 Guadalupe Yard tragedy. Maria Chavez, senior HR analyst, will 
will provide the report. Good evening. Uh, my name is Maria Chavez, a senior HR analyst here for Retirement Services at ETA. Also with me is Alice Ellsberg, an actuary with Chiron, and Janica Maldonado with the law firm of Wren Public Law Group. In the wake of the unprecedented and tragic deaths at the Guadalupe Rail Yard on May the 26th of 2021, the board directed VTA staff to consider potential short and long-term financial assistance that VTA could provide to the families of the May 26 victims, which include those employees who lost their lives that day and the employee who witnessed the horrific event and took his own life shortly thereafter. Specifically, the board expressed interest in ensuring that the families of all victims were able to receive a pension benefit, even where the victim was not otherwise eligible for such a benefit at the time of his death. All of the victims were before or at their time of death, members of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 265. VTA and ATU jointly administer a pension benefit for ATU members. Acting at the board's request, staff engaged Chiron, an actuarial firm, to prepare an actuarial analysis in order to understand the costs that would be associated with providing a pension benefit of at least $3,000 per month for each of the victim's families under the VTA ATU pension plan. The actuarial, uh, I'm sorry, the actuary determined that the cost of providing this alternative pre-retirement death benefit is to be $4,900,000. VTA and ATU have entered into a side letter agreement subject to the board's approval of the present resolution and other conditions to amend the party's collective bargaining agreement to authorize the provision of these alternative pre-retirement death benefits to the victim's designated family members. The side letter and the amendment of the party's collective bargaining agreement to effectuate the provision of these alternative pre-retirement death benefits are not precedent setting and are specifically to only the families of the 10 victims of the horrific tragedy on May the 26th, 2021. Staff now provides the board with the resolution necessary to effectuate the board's desire to provide such benefits. Should the board wish to move forward, the board may make a motion to adopt the resolution. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Maria. We will now take public comment. There are no hands raised, Chair. Okay. We'll close public comment on this item. Um, to my colleagues, are there any questions? Chavez, move approval. All right. Can I get a second, please? This is Hendrick, second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Elaine, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes, this is for item 8.3, Bert. Yes. Thank you. Carrasco? Aye. Chavez? Yes. Constantine? Aye. Hendrix? Yes. Jane? Yes. Jimenez? Jones? Aye. Lee? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Paul? Yes. Morales. Yeah. Motion passed, Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, next is item 8.4, which is to authorize the general manager to execute a major capital construction contract with Balfour BD Infrastructure Incorporated, the lowest responsive and responsible bidder in the amount of $15,671,680. For the construction of the OCS Rehabilitation Phase 3 project and increase the available contract change order authority from the standard 15% to 25% to make the total available contract amount $19,589,605.05. Adolf Dabol, Senior, yes. Transportation, yes. Senior Transportation Engineer, is here to answer any questions. But before can you we, hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, we can hear you. But before we take any questions, I'd like to take uh, public uh, comments on this item first. There are no hands raised, Chair. Okay. 
So we'll now uh, close um, public comments. And um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I, uh, yes, may, may I may I just briefly recuse myself under the uh, uh, the government code section uh, that I cited previously in the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay, you're recused. All right. Um, so Adolf, uh, are you prepared to make a presentation or just available for comments and questions? I, I'm available for comments and questions. Um, the, the scope itself includes 23.6 miles of contact wire replacement in the south, 14 and a half miles of contact wire replacement in the north, uh, for a total of 38 miles of contact wire. Um, we have uh, made an analysis and, and it shows that it's exceeded the 20% wear on the OCS. So any further wear and tear may cause a delay in the replacement of the contact wire. Um, so that's why we need to replace the wire as soon as possible. Great, thank, thank you very much, Adolf. Are there any questions from uh, my colleagues for, for staff? Uh, Director Jane. Yeah, I was just curious about um, why you had to raise the change order authority above the standard level. Yeah, there, there were a couple of issues that would come up. Uh, one is um, materials. There, there's a possibility of inflation. One is materials and one is labor costs. So in the next two years, it's possible the material cost might go up. Uh, what we're planning to do is purchase all the materials up front to avoid any delay uh, in inflation. Okay, thank you. And can I get a, um, I don't see other Chair people Jones. here. As I heard Chair a motion. Jones, this is, this oh, is Cindy. Um, may I ask a question of staff? Sure, go ahead. Of course. I, thank you. I apologize. I can't figure out how to raise my hand here. But um, the, the the question I have is you know, the method of lowest responsive and responsible bidder um, made me wonder about our ability to um, to use best value contracting. And if that's a tool that we have available to us, to us at VTA. Yeah, well, we did an analysis and we had a pre-qualification process that started in November on November 1st, and there were six pre-qualified contractors, but there were only three bidders. Uh, one was C3M, one was LK Comstock, and one was Bob for Beatty. Uh, the estimate was around 21 million and Two of them, LK Comstock and C3M, were around 22 and 23 million, 23 million about 23, 24. Um, whereas Balfour Beatty happened to be local. They also had their equipment locally and their laborers locally. Um, so in a way, they weren't outside California, they were here. Um, so that's why we kind of analyzed the estimates and came out with Balfour Beatty as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. And they also met the DBE goal of 2.97%. So they, their goal is 3%. Um, the question I'm asking, and I, by the way, I thought the staff report was very well done. Mm -hmm. What I'm asking is, do we have the option? I understand we use the a pre-qualification, which I, I actually really support. Mm -hmm. um, but my question is, do we have the option at BTA of using different tools like as a, as a tool instead of lowest responsive, responsible bidder? Um, I think they have enough equipment to perform the work. I, um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not asking about their capacity. I'm asking whether or not BTA, mm -hmm. the constraints of the rules that we operate under can use a different method of, of contracting called best value contracting, or are we held to lowest responsible bidder for some reason? Yeah. Maybe that's, somebody uh, in first year might could respond to that. And, uh, yeah. and Greg, 
Greg has his hand raised, Cindy. Uh, Greg, uh, you want to respond to it? Well, I was just to say, uh, Board Member Chavez, that, that is a question for procurement. I just sent a note to see if I, I do not know the answer to that question, but I would I would think we do. But um, while we're on, oh, I see Sonny just raised her hand. So let me see if Sonny will respond to you. So I will I will defer. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Sonny. Hi. Yes, we do have best value, and we do use best value quite often. This one was a low bid um, solicitation, but oftentimes we do best value. Thank depending you. on the scope of work, when we start with the solicitation, like, for instance, our bus procurements um, are best value. Um, many, many of our procurements are best value. But, and, but we don't, do we often use it for construction or more for procurement of goods? Uh, more for services, actually. Uh, oh, less, okay. less for construction. It's mostly uh, for services. I appreciate that. Thank you for the information. Thank you. And the report was very, very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I was going to say there's a whole series of, uh, of um, characteristics or however you might say that the type of services or um, product that we're uh, buying and the dollar amounts and what we're doing as to whether best value fits in or not. So there is an analysis on that. Um, I, I'm not... Um, is you know on the construction typically on these construction state of good repair we are typically are using um, the low bid process that's typically what we have been done and at times we um, choose to do that um, because it is easier than using the best value um, in terms of the procurement and the reason why we're doing the procurement we have to have reasons to do best value thank you thank you and i I, um, you know, one other thing, I know we're going to revisit this issue, but I am, uh, remain very interested in the analysis used um, to determine the DBE goal and would love an opportunity to make sure that the, you know, under that section, when we are looking at um, the business delivery requirements that or I'm sorry, business diversity requirements that the analysis is also present in the staff report. Mm -hmm. Not the not the fact of it, but the the way we got to it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, uh, Director Constantine. Thank you, Chair. In regards to the uh, business diversity requirements, you know, um, uh, based on the the opportunities, uh, the Office of Business Diversity has put a, a percentage of two point nine seven as for uh, a, a disadvantaged business enterprises. The contractor has uh, stated there they will do a percentage of 3% even. Correct. Uh, do we have any any um, safety measures in that in regard to make sure they do follow through with that percentage or exceed uh, it? No, no, we, we will definitely monitor and make sure that they meet that goal. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, don't see any other hands raised. Uh, uh, Evelyn? Thank you, Chair. I understand that um, Member Licardo uh, recused himself under 84308, but because this is a low bid situation, it's actually exempt um, from that. And so um, he, he may uh, participate in this item. Okay, thank you. I unrecused myself. All right, uh, Director Licardo has been unrecused. And can I get a motion and a second on this item, please? So move. It's been Second. moved by Director Burt. Second, Constantine. Second by Constantine. Uh, Elaine, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, this is for item 8.4. Burt? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Chavez? No. Chavez is no. Constantine? Aye. Hendricks? No. Jane? Yes. Jimenez? Minutes is absent. Jones? Aye. Lee? Aye. Ricardo? Ricardo? I'll come back to you. Sorry, that was an aye. My bad. Thank you. Paul? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you.
Thank you. Next is item 8.5, which is to receive a presentation from the California High Speed Rail regarding the San Jose and Merced final environmental impact report, environmental impact statement. At this time, I'd like to welcome Boris Lipkin, Northern California Regional Director. Welcome, Boris. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Jones and uh, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you uh, tonight. Uh, I think we're going to pull up the slides. And uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Boris Lipkin, Northern California Regional Director with the High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, I'll give just a, a quick, really quick update on the overall High Speed Rail program and then focus in on uh, the final EIR EIS for the stretch, getting us from the Central Valley to the Bay Area to San Jose. Uh, which uh, we published back in February, and uh, we're headed to our board of directors on it at the end of this month. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just background on uh, this, the California High Speed Rail project. Uh, many of you will probably remember the proposition back in 2008. Uh, what the voters approved uh, is a statewide high speed rail system uh, with two phases in, in, in its core. So the first phase being the blue line on the map from San Francisco. Uh, to Los Angeles and Anaheim, and then the phase two extensions uh, up to Sacramento and down to San Diego. Uh, the goals of the program are, of course, to improve our, our mobility. Many of our cities are located at roughly the distances where high-speed rail has uh, big travel time advantages relative to auto or air travel. And so we're the geography of California is well-suited uh, for this type of system, and that's what we see being successful internationally and where these systems have been implemented. Uh, we've also looked at continued growth in uh, population and, and uh, the need to continue to invest in, in uh, modes that really take cars off the road and start to move us towards uh, more sustainable modes of transportation. Uh, and obviously, uh, that's a big part of why we're doing what we're doing. We're not in position to continue to expand you know, runways at SFO or uh, widening our major freeways. Uh, and so this is what we're going to need to meet uh, future transportation demand across the state. And then the last piece I'll just mention on kind of the big picture is, of course, the economics uh, starting to tie our regional economies together uh, really starts to make uh, the sum greater, the whole greater than the sum of its parts uh, as we tie the state together in ways that it's uh, much harder to get around uh, today. Uh, so that's the background on kind of where we where we started from the voters back in 2008. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, just to give a sense of where we're at at this moment. Uh, so taking that same kind of phase one map, uh, we have uh, on uh, going on the right side, uh, 119 miles of the system are currently under construction. Uh, that's the largest rail construction project anywhere in the country. You can see one of the, the structures that we're building is, is behind me here. That's our uh, southern entrance into, into Fresno. Uh, at the same time, we've environmentally cleared uh, about 300 miles out of the 500 miles of the statewide system. That's shown in red. Uh, in the Bay Area, of course, we're uh, helping to electrify the Caltrain corridor. We're contributing about a third of the funding uh, towards that project. And we're working on continuing to advance each part of the system, ultimately to bring the entire system first environmentally cleared and then ultimately, of course, constructed. Uh, and so the stretch that I'm going to talk about today is the part getting from that end of that red line uh, kind of uh, in branching off towards the Bay Area and getting us all the way to uh, San Jose. Yeah, there we go, you have the cursor there. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this project section really is an important one for us. Uh, this is a map that we had in our draft 2022 business plan showing sort of the interconnectivity that's offered in the Bay Area. And this really starts to tie in from where we are in construction today in the Central Valley to that core transit network uh, through the San Jose Diridon Station. And so what this really starts to do, if you go, if you click on the next one, you know, we're, that connection is really the, this key part of tying the Silicon Valley and the Central Valley together, reducing travel times and making the trip from say San Jose to Fresno instead of, you know, three hours by car to, or, or more, depending on what happens on 152, bring that down to just a one hour travel time by train really creating opportunities to improve our jobs housing balance between the two regions, increasing ridership, reducing VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for us on kind of the, the statewide system, if you click on the next one, of course, the key connection is, you know, this section would give, let us serve the largest city in the Bay Area and the largest county. I know I'm speaking to uh, the, the county transportation agency from, <laughs> so uh, you will be uh, very familiar with that, of course. Um, and uh, if you go to the next one, it also gives us really critical connections to a variety of transit providers. So Caltrain, the BART system that, that 
the, your agency is helping extend to Deridon, uh, of course, the VTA light rail and bus networks, Capital Corridor ACE, and even the extensions that are being planned uh, from Gilroy down to Monterey County. Uh, so really uh, critical connections. Uh, and the last part is, is we're planning the, the system between uh, San Jose and Gilroy. We're really looking, and this is what our preferred alternative does, of how we integrate that with local Caltrain service, extending that electrification down from where it currently ends in San Jose uh, through South San Jose and South Santa Clara County, and of course, Morgan Hill and Gilroy uh, on that shared uh, corridor and if, before we turn to, to the east to get to the Central Valley. Um, so if you go to the next one, please. Uh, so for this project section, uh, we've been working on it a very long time. We actually started the environmental clearance process back in 2009, so where uh, it took us 13 years to get through this. Uh, but we uh, had published our draft environmental document uh, back in the spring of 2020, right after COVID had started. Uh, we issued a, a revised and supplemental draft EIR EIS uh, focused on some changes in regulations around uh, certain wildlife species. Uh, in last last spring, and then uh, we are now at the final EIR EIS stage. So uh, that was published, <clears throat> excuse me, in late February. It's available on our website, uh, and we are bringing it to our board of directors at the end of this month. They'll have a two day two day board meeting on April twenty seventh and twenty uh, eighth to consider uh, the final environmental document uh, and the record of decision. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, I, I, this is a little bit tough because we're try trying to give you an overview of a very, very large document. But as uh, folks will probably be aware of what's generally included in these things is you know, an analysis of the alternatives uh, and their impacts and effects, uh, a proposed uh, suite of mitigations for the impacts that we do have. Uh, when we published the draft, we received public comment. So uh, all of those are included as well as our responses and revisions uh, based on those comments that we received. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, just in terms of the alternatives that we have studied, uh, this is roughly the 90 mile section uh, of between San Jose and Merced. Uh, there are four alternatives uh, that were considered in the EIR EIS. Uh, three of them are dedicated alternatives. So it's just high-speed rail service by itself. Uh, and they vary kind of in the stretch between uh, San Jose and Gilroy. The preferred alternative is alternative four, which uses the existing rail corridor. That's the purple line on the map uh, that extends that electrification, uh, electrified system and blended corridor uh, from Deardon Station down to a downtown station in Gilroy before we turn uh, east and head across Pacheco Pass, where we have uh, two tunnel sections totaling uh, over 15 miles of tunneling to get uh, through Pacheco Pass and get us out uh, to the Central Valley. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at Deridon Station, uh, since there's a lot of work going on there, just want to quickly uh, highlight what we're proposing it are basically the modifications at the station in order to accommodate high-speed rail service. Uh, so what you see on the uh, graphic there, the two kind of uh, long uh, blue uh, platforms are the ones that would be used by high-speed high -speed rail services. The ones on the outside would be used by Caltrain, by, by ACE and Capital Corridor and others. Um, and then we're proposing two overpasses to get passengers basically modified, uh, modified the access to the station to get passengers to and from uh, those platforms, but overall uh, really leaving a lot to the DISC partnership in terms of uh, the much bigger vision uh, for uh, what Deardown Station can become. Uh, and so being very cognizant of the interface between those, uh, those two, two items there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, the basis for the preferred alternative uh, using the existing rail corridor means that we have fewer impacts outside the rail corridor. So fewest displacements, uh, fewest impacts to wetlands and natural habitats uh, and parks, uh, lowest capital cost and also allows the, that extension of electrified Caltrain service uh, as a uh, additional joint benefit, again, that the other alternatives uh, don't, don't offer in this, in this project section. Uh, next slide, please. So just on the process uh, with uh, public comments, uh, we, when we issued the draft, we received almost 750 submissions, totaling almost uh, 4,900 comments. On the revised, we, uh, we got an additional 16 submissions with about 200 comments. So overall, about our team has been working on responding to each of those 5,000 comments. Fortunately, some of them were a form letter. So we got the, if you submit the same comment, you get the same response, which is a little bit easier to, to respond to. But, uh, to try to summarize the uh, entire suite of 5,000 comments in one slide, 
Uh, of course, they covered a, a variety of different topics, everything from alternatives, wildlife habitat and movement, at great crossings, uh, traffic, environmental justice, uh, and, and many other topics along the way. Uh, the, what we've done with those comments, of course, is we've responded to each one, but we've also, where, where appropriate, either modified or provided additional analysis to really uh, study those issues that were raised uh, and uh, either modified or added mitigations as well in terms in response to the comments that we received. Uh, and so again, just trying to give a, at least, a, if you go to the next slide, uh, one topic that is, um, I, I, is my, my, I chose one topic to cover kind of a, in a little more, uh, give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the issues that we've dealt with along the way. And this is one that I, I think has uh, some really, uh, really good story behind it in terms of our work with uh, many uh, of the key stakeholders is in, in the areas that we, that this corridor serves, we have a, a variety of uh, really sensitive wildlife areas and key to wildlife movement. Uh, in sort of five chunks uh, in, in Cody Valley, in the Soap Lake floodplain, as we get through Pacheco Pass and several different areas, and in the Grasslands Ecological Area. And we've worked with, with stakeholders in each one of those uh, to really look at how that movement works today, how we can not only address our impact of building a, a large linear transportation project, but really also uh, uh, improve the condition from what the, there is today. Uh, and so if you go to the next slide, uh, focusing in uh, just on Cody Valley, because I know that that's a, a topic that's very near and dear to uh, many in Santa Clara County. Uh, you know, what we've worked on is making sure that the crossings that we are proposing uh, cover both our corridor, but also uh, Monterey Road, which is one of the most dangerous uh, roads for a lot of roadkill happens uh, there through, through Coyote Valley. Uh, and we've worked with the Open Space Authority, the, the Habitat Agency, Pathways for Wildlife and others, on the sizing and, and the siting of the wildlife crossings. And what we heard from uh, the Open Space Authority recently was that as they're looking at their master planning for conservation in Coyote Valley, they're really using the, the placement of these uh, crossings that we were planning in, for the rail corridor and Monterey Road as, the, as a sort of a foundational element of where they're looking to conserve additional lands. And so it's been a very successful partnership uh, where we've definitely benefited from their expertise in knowing exactly what, what's happening and where conservative lands are today, as well as our ability to improve what's there today and uh, address additional issues along the way. Um, so that's just my, uh, one of my personal fa favorites for, from some of the work that, we, that our team has been doing uh, over the many years uh, in, in this project section. Uh, and I think I have just one more slide uh, on the process, uh, what's coming up in front of our board of directors uh, is that the board will sort of be considering three actions. Uh, first, certifying the EIR EIS. Uh, then they will look to, uh, it, we'll be asking them to approve the preferred alternative and the related CEQA documents. And then uh, they would, if they choose to do so, direct the authority CEO to issue the record of decision, which would uh, finish the uh, federal NEPA environmental uh, process. Uh, and so that would be sort of the end of the environmental clearance phase. And then if you go to the next one, you know, what that does for us is, of course, uh, a major milestone. It helps us with uh, being able to seek uh, additional state and federal resources to advance the program, ultimately get to construction on it, uh, and advance our project work, including uh, getting the design moving forward, our third party agreements. We know, you know, for example, we'll have uh, several different places where we interface with, uh, with VTA, uh, where we will need to be uh, working very closely with your team uh, on those, uh, as well as, you know, advancing our uh, our work on, on right-of-way mapping appraisals and continuing to engage with our communities as we uh, move the project forward. Uh, so with that, I think that's my uh, last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, hopefully you, that was just a brief overview. If you wanna get a more in-depth presentation, come to our board of directors meeting and we'll, we'll be doing a, a much deeper dive into the EIR, but that's the snapshot of it for you. Okay, thank you, Boris. Um, now we'll go to uh, public comments. Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Yes, we do, Chair. We have one member of the public with their hand raised. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair Vickman here. It's a lonely public comment April time <laughs> for a VTA Board of Directors meeting. Uh, yeah, for this item, you know, I think... Uh, I'm really unknowledgeable about this project, but I'm trying to learn. 
uh, interesting item for me today to sit and learn about. I think it is really important how to consider the future of building CHSR throughout the state in terms of less amount of impact on, on taking out people's homes and displacing people. Uh, I'm really interested in that concept and I'm really interested in the ideas of how this project can be accessible to all parts of the Bay Area and not just San Jose. And so that means Dublin, Livermore, Tracy, uh, even, you know, Richmond areas, uh, Antioch, stuff like that. Uh, good luck how all of the Bay Area can be open and inclusive to this project. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more hand raised. Kitty, you may begin speaking when ready. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Kitty Moore uh, speaking for myself only. I have a question about the process with regards to the certification of the EIR. And I was just wondering if any other um, committees uh, within VTA have a first look at the EIR before it's certified. Uh, I'm just uh, curious about that, having another you know, set of eyes, uh, taking a look similar to what you have when uh, EIRs would go through a planning commission first, or for us, we also have an en environmental review committee. All right, that's my question, thank you. Boris? Uh, sorry, sorry, Chair. I wasn't sure if you would want me to respond. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I guess the the answer to that one is uh, it, at our board of directors. Uh, ultimately, the high speed rail authority board of directors is the one that approves uh, or would be asked to certify the environmental document, not the VTA board. Uh, so today's presentation is an information item for VTA uh, awareness and making sure that you were obviously. Uh, communicating with you about the, the document, but ultimately uh, this would go to our board of directors and uh, we it would not go through any committees before that uh, for our board. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised from the public, so I'll close public comments. Uh, Boris, I have a, a question for you, and that is uh, grade separation or um, once uh, high speed rail hits Santa Clara County, Will all of the crossings be grade separated or will you have at grade crossings? So in the preferred alternative, uh, as we have on the rest of the blended system, we are not proposing to grade separate. Uh, we are uh, gonna be improving each of the at grade crossings and uh, in compliance with the safety requirements for FRA and CPUC. Uh, but uh, we also recognize that that's a topic of interest in many of the communities that we that we serve. And uh, I think what we've seen kind of up and down the Caltrain corridors, there is a, a big push and a big need uh, for grade separations. Uh, and uh, we have been a partner in some of those. And we recently entered into a uh, MOU with the city of San Jose, for example, to uh, help advance the work on some of the grade separations, uh, specifically focused in, in South San Jose, as well as through the disc process around uh, Deerdown Station. Uh, but from a high speed rail perspective, you know, we we see those as projects generally led by the local jurisdictions with support from the rail agencies. And so um, that's the role that we're uh, we're playing in that in the great separation conversation. Right. So potentially you could have a train going 110 miles an hour at grade going across crossing the, an intersection. That's uh, yes, that's in line with the uh, uh, our proposal as well as the requirements from CPUC and FRA. Great. Thank you. Um, Director Licardo. Oh, I'm sorry. Wasn't mute. Uh, was muted. Uh, hey, thanks, Chair. And uh, thank you, Boris, for the presentation. Um, I just had a question about alternatives, about what was studied and what wasn't studied. Uh, you know, for my 30,000 foot level, knowing very little about uh, engineering um, or any of the other many issues that you guys have to grapple with. It just seemed to me that Pacheco Pass is, is the big challenge, right? It's the most costly part of this project. I think if I'm not mistaken, it's going to be the longest tunnel in North America. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And, wrong. and I just would have assumed there would have been some environmental study of Hey, what happens if we take this thing above the freeway and elevate it and um, and try to make up the time somewhere else on the route? 
Um, I don't know, obviously, how much time that does take off if you have to make those turns. But I'm just kind of surprised, given the really monumental cost of getting through Pacheco, why more alternatives were not analyzed other than just digging a giant hole to that mountain. Yeah, I mean, I guess to the history on studying of, of Pacheco, there were uh, analyses of different routes through the pass uh, in sort of the uh, alternatives analysis stages uh, before settling in on the route uh, that was ultimately part of the EIR EIS. Uh, the issues for tunneling, it's not, you know, speed is obviously one, uh, but there's also uh, ver various other things in terms of uh, grades and sense of habitats uh, and uh, conserved lands uh, through the past, which are some of the other uh, reasons, uh, inclu and including the uh, San Luis Reservoir, uh, for the uh, need for tunneling in that stretch uh, to get through the mountains uh, uh, there. So. Uh, some options were looked at. Uh, I don't know if we looked at the over the freeway one specifically that, that you mentioned, uh, but I do think there would be probably some other challenges on grades and uh, curves that would be uh, part of that one. But by that, you mean you'd have to slow the train down too much to be able to make uh, well you, turns? Well, uh, you may simply not be, uh, the turning radius on a high-speed train is about, uh, at a minimum, about 650 feet. At, basically, that's at zero speed. Uh, really? And there are, yeah. Um, and so as you go, you know, it's even at basic speeds, the curves are still uh, can get basically to a place where you, you cannot operate safely. Um, again, it depends. This is this is dangerous, uh, Mr. Mayor, where it's me and you talking about uh, engineering <laughs> okay. requirements. So I, I think uh, I will just say, you know, without having an engineer on the line to contradict me, I'll just say that uh, there's uh, challenges in terms of curves and grades that uh, lead you towards as you're kind of crossing through mountains uh, where tunneling becomes one of the only options. Uh, and uh, if you would like to dig into that deeper with some of our engineers, I'm happy to set up a time uh, for them to give you the more nuanced answer than the one that I can give. Uh, but I, you know, there was a lot of, a lot that went into uh, the crossing of Pacheco and lots of analysis that was behind that. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way. Thanks, Boris. I appreciate it. Look, I, I, I uh, understand I'm well um, beyond my skis here in terms of understanding what's what, but I, if what you're telling me is that, you know, to borrow from Ralph Nader, it would be unsafe at any speed to go over the freeway because of the grade and churn issues. I get it. Uh, although I, I can't say, I just assumed if you slowed the train down enough, you could make a turn, but it sounds like you're saying that's just not possible. Again, I think there there would be some issues that I can, but I I, okay. I would hate to misguide, uh, not give you uh, accurate information. So if you would like, I, I'm happy to follow up with some more engineers and and uh, do, and follow up with you directly on. That, yeah, that's all right. I don't want to take up a lot of your time. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Boris. Yeah. Thank you, Director Hendricks. Yeah, thank you. First off, I want to disagree with Mayor Licardo. I think he actually understands a lot about engineering <laughs> large construction projects. Um, so I understand you're here talking about the EIR and stuff, but could you share anything with us about actual construction timing, expectation for when we, you know, see trains into San Jose or San Francisco? Can you just, because you didn't have any kind of timing on here at all. Can you share some of that with us, please? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the timing question is obviously linked to a funding question because uh, that's the, the long pole in the tent on getting the system here. So if we had all the money today, uh, we're about a decade out from having service to Deardon Station. Uh, my focus right now is, you know, uh, while uh, I would love to have all the cash and, you know, available for all the full construction is we have, uh, and I, I try to briefly describe it on the, on the last slide in terms of our next steps in terms of advancing design, uh, in Pacheco Pass, doing the geotechnical investigations, acquiring right of way, those things are uh, a several year process just to get to construction. So we're probably in the uh, three to five years until we could, we could be in construction if we were to uh, be doing all those steps uh, right away after we finish environmental clearance. Um, after that, you know, that's where the big dollars come in, uh, frankly, in terms of uh, the, the work to get to, to the Bay Area. Uh, and so we're uh, doing the work to Get ourselves ready uh, to, and uh, as we pursue those, you know, uh, the funding sources that'll be needed uh, to ultimately build out the system uh, in this part of the state. So my recap is, it's a decade plus if we had the all the money today and we don't. 
So it's even longer than that. On page three of your slide, I think you had a little um, orange cone up near San Jose that showed um, you were doing grade separation construction work. Where is that? Um, I think the one that we had is a little further north. Uh, it, it, that was, uh, we were part of the 25th Avenue grade separation project, which was recently completed in San Mateo. Uh, so that one uh, was, uh, we, we partnered with the city there and Caltrain and the county. Uh, on that one, uh, one of the options that we've been looking, we had been looking at on the peninsula would include a passing track in that location. And so uh, we uh, helped fund uh, a part of that grade separation to ensure that it had the width uh, available for uh, that if it was necessary. And that was opened, I believe, last year. I'd like to follow up with uh, Vice Chair uh, or Vice Mayor Jones's comments about grade separations. And if I heard your comments correctly, you're very um, passionate about this project where we're creating wildlife um, crossings um, at, uh, for the railroad track. I heard you say here that wildlife concerns are part of the questions that came up arose around uh, placement of above ground track um, in Pacheco. Are, are, you know, bicycle pedestrian concerns weighted at the same level as all of that wildlife concern in terms of, um, you know, the need for grade separation? Certainly those are very important. And I think what we've tried to do is ensure that there is, you know, safe uh, both pedestrian and, and bicycle and auto ways to get across the rail corridor. Uh, you know, we have an alternative that we looked at that was fully grade separated. It has massive impacts on the surrounding communities uh, with those projects uh, in terms of displacements. It's, you know, hundreds of homes uh, in terms of those, those options. That's why we've, you know, and this has been some of the history of, you know, looking at some of those questions where we have seen that the local communities are generally better placed to be the ones trading, looking at those trade-offs and weighing them. And we, you know, in terms of how to design and then ultimately implement great separation projects. So I, we definitely think that there's a, a state role in that in helping to move that forward. But it starts from at least our perspective at the local level. Uh, I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm trying to understand the distinction you're making between a fully grade separated thing that you guys would propose versus what could be end up being a fully grade separated solution if the local agencies proposed it, you know, presumably they don't have to have all that eminent domain issue. It's really a question of who funds, right? So I'm just trying to understand what the difference is between if it's a high-speed rail proposed solution, well, here it's got all these impacts, um, but you'd fund it all. But if it's local projects, oh, they probably wouldn't have all those impacts, but somebody else has to pay for it. I'm just, do you get my the, the distinction I'm trying to understand? I mean, I guess what I would say is there are clearly trade-offs between cost design and uh, impact implications in, in local communities around grade separation projects. Those are, everyone can weigh those differently and come up with different answers of what the right answer is to on, on a very local basis for what's important in, the, in those considerations. That's all I was trying to say. Oh, I guess I'm just trying to understand is, is high-speed rail, if you guys were going to do a fully grade separated alternative, it sounds like you would provide funding for it. Are you, is high-speed rail willing to assist with funding for grade separations to local agencies that are trying to look at individual um, requirements and implementations for grade separation? So I think what, what I would say is we looked at various options. One of them was a higher speed option that was fully grade separated where grade separations are required. The preferred alternative that we're proposing does not have grade separations because it operates at a lower speed. Uh, in terms of local grade separation projects, we would certainly want to be working with the communities and, and we see a role for the state to be a partner in funding those. The governor has proposed, uh, I believe it was uh, $500 million in this year's budget towards grade separation projects as part of the transportation package. Uh, we see that as a, you know, a massive step forward from where the state has been, frankly, where it's been providing 15 million a year uh, for a very long time through the existing program that exists on grade separations. Uh, and so there's clearly more that needs to be done at all levels. Uh, based on what I saw, I think, from uh, the Caltrain business plan was they estimated the need for grade separations in the Caltrain corridor that from all the local projects that are already on the books 
of something in the eight to eleven billion dollars of total investment. So the only way that I, you know, the, the the way that these projects have happened has been through leveraging of different funds from different sources, including local, regional, state, and at times even federal funds to move them forward. So we see the the role that we can play in helping move that on the state side of things. Uh, but it's not going to be an answer of, yeah, high speed rail is just going to fund every great separation project. Yeah, and I wasn't looking for that as an answer, although that would have been great, is I'm just trying to make the distinction that, you know, you use the words at locations where grade separations are required. And I know there's a technical set of rules of where you say you do and don't have to do them. I would just like to share from the perspective of our communities that are along the corridor that they believe grade separation is required. You know, it's, you've got, because a hundred mile an hour plus train at grade, even, and I've seen all the, the things that'll come down and how that's, that's done, is very scary for a lot of people. And there are just challenges with, you know, from a bicycle, pedestrian, as well as vehicular. So I'm just trying to offer the perspective that as we're looking at alternatives and looking at funding, that I hope we take as much consideration at any grade separation, not just the ones that you guys meet some criteria that says it must be required, that we take as, as much consideration as we are for wildlife crossing and we're doing great separation and those kind of things that we're trying to apply that same logic to other grade separations along the corridor where we're going to have 100 mile an hour plus trains um, at grade with pedestrians and and uh, on bicycles so that's really the message I'm trying to help drive forward so thank you very much thank you director Burke yeah, I'd just like to follow on to uh, Chair Jones and uh, Director Hendricks on the grade separation issue. So I appreciate that um, uh, high-speed rail really has a dilemma. Um, they they don't have the funding that they need for the project. The Pacheco cost that was baked into the last business plan to the legislature appears to be uh, significantly higher than what the legislature received and um and there there is no funding in high speed rails budget even though they don't they don't have the funding for the budget they have and they sure don't have the funding uh, to budget for grade separations um but it doesn't change uh the fact of the real need for grade separations and i understand that operating your trains below 125 miles an hour does not trigger a federally mandated grade separation. But as uh, Director Hendricks just was describing, that, that's really different from not just the perception of the community, but the reality of a need to grade separate a train system uh, that's gonna have trains at that kind of speed. Um, this, this system was never supposed to be, it was never sold to the, the voters as one that uh, would not be grade separated. Uh, Ratcheting on this section below 125 gets you through a legal uh, threshold, but it's it's not what the voters envision. It's not what the communities need. It's not your fault. Um, but um, when you said that, well, there's been some interest in grade separations, that's just a, a huge understatement uh, that I think we need to be more forthright. Uh, and we as as officials here need to be more forthright on that this thing just can't fly um, without grade separations. Thank you, um, Director Chavez. Thank you, I, I, um, I think I wanna reinforce what you just said, Pat. I think that, um, I think that the grade steps are a significant desire of every community um, along the tracks. And so I, I just wanted to reinforce that. Um, the other issue I wanted to just raise with my colleagues is that the, um, the policy advisory board that for the Deer Down Arena Station had a very robust meeting, our last meeting. And a big part of that was around how um, we do a much better job of integrating all of the um, activities at the Deer Down Station. And I raise that because I have a significant concern that 
the the way that high speed rail is coming in um, is is very different than um, well not different. It, I don't believe all of our programs are integrated, and I'm I'm nervous about it. And I'm raising that because I know um, Boris. I don't know if you did you present at our last meeting. I did. Okay. Um, and so I didn't know if if you um, you know representing high speed rail had an opportunity to talk to the other partners about the issues that the policy advisory board made because it really was it wasn't just myself it was really an overall um, level of angst from I, I think the board itself uh, can you give us any thoughts or perspectives since that meeting yeah I mean uh, there have been continued conversations at the staff level since uh, that meeting and I think there's a uh, another JPAB meeting couple, coming up in a couple of weeks. I, I think it's on the 22nd, uh, where we're working on uh, doing as much as we can to be responsive to those uh, the items that were raised in back in February. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there are uh, certainly good questions around, you know, how do we uh, move uh, the DISC project forward in terms of what would it take? And I, I know some of that was focused on, you know, how to get to an environmental clearance process. Uh, there were also some of the questions around uh, sort of the governance and you know the potential formation of a JPA or other entity uh, to sort of take on some of that. So uh, there has definitely been focus since that meeting on those questions. Uh, and I don't know that we'll have every answer in a couple of weeks, uh, but we certainly want to be uh, responsive to the advisory board's uh, request and the angst that we certainly heard from uh, the policymakers there. Thank you. And colleagues, I'll just say that I think um, what we were concerned about is every entity sort of treating the real estate like it was just going to function around them and that the property is not being integrated in a way that would make it user friendly or customer friendly and that decisions were being made now that may impede the, the integration of the um, different transit modes. That, that's kind of what where we landed. And I think the points, Boris, thank you for reminding me, the po points about governance and how uh, you know how it would be financially managed and invested in in the long term were also um, points that were raised and I'm, I'm glad you raised that as well. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, this was an information item so we don't need a motion. So thank you Boris for that presentation. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. On to item 8.6, which is to receive an update on the Silicon Valley Rapid Transit Program. In Taki Salpizas, BART Silicon Valley Extension Project Chief will provide the report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board members. Uh, this is my typical monthly presentation. Um, I have a couple updates here. Uh, the number one update, the bullet, it's probably old news, but it's, it's a terrific news. Our project made it to the president's fiscal year 23 budget uh, with 200 million assigned to this. Um, we continue working with FTA, several meetings with FTA, very cooperative, good coordination, and we get ready, you know, when we are ready to, to start. Um, getting to the point where we can initiate discussions on FFGA. Our real estate acquisition program is going pretty good. Um, yes, we did make progress. Negotiations are well underway for the key properties. And I believe we're gonna be on schedule on these things. Um, we started now the second round and the final round of the cooperative agreements with the cities. We still have work to do with our partner cities. We work with the city of San Jose. We work with the city of Santa Clara. I know we have back and forth going on and I believe we're gonna be good in the second quarter of 2022. We should really have a good framework on that. And uh, the last but not least is now we are to the final technical execution of our agreements. The, for the third parties, such as the city of San Jose, the permitting environment, Santa Clara, the same thing, JPB, Joint Powers Board, PGE, we're working with PGE on several fronts. One of them is to bring 
power to get ready for our tunnel machine. So I'll keep you updated on that as we're going on. Next page, Elaine, please. Uh, my typical page, I update you every month where we are with our procurement. Our systems contract is gonna be out the end of this month. We're having a little bit of uh, uh, a week or two delays because there's a coordination issue with our tunnel contract while we're waiting to finish the negotiations on our tunnel contract. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that we are really making good progress on our tunnel contract negotiations. We are targeting to be before you for the first step approval next month. For that, we still have work ahead of us, quite a few items, but um, we hope I'll be before you next month asking you for an approval, for an approval to do the initial phase of design by the contractor. Proposed innovations, we received several innovations from the contractor, we're still working on that. And of course, allow the contractor to do his construction plan. Uh, construction planning. For that, this is, our targets are very good here, look okay. Then the Santa Clara station and the New Hall Yard, we did have now the second round of interviews with the contractors. We're talking to them towards the development of our final RFP sometime at the end of the summer. I know we're working with the city of Santa Clara, Director Jane and others, to finalize a couple issues, which we want to have done before we finalize our documents. And the stations, no activity at this time. We have posted this contract, as you know, waiting to hear, um, to see where we are with the tunnel. And then after we have the tunnel um, feedback and specifications, we're gonna start working on this. My last page is the, Elaine, my last page is the framework. We talked about this before. I added a couple arrows at the end of our bars here, just to, because now we're finalizing the RFPs and the documents. I want to make, we want to make sure that the contractors are very clear in their minds that when they finish their work, they are not going home. They're gonna stay and supporting us to do the final testing, acceptance and pre-revenue operations which BAT's gonna start. This is my update for this month. Should you have any questions, I'm all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Takis. Um, we're now going to go to uh, public comments. Um, do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item and that you have something of this item uh, each uh, BOD public meeting session. Thank you. Um, also, I think a thank you uh, as with the previous item and I think with this item too, I think we're starting to uh, address the MTC a bit more openly in the uh, public meeting process and that they can be a good facilitator when we at the VTA may have issues and questions. Uh, it seems the case in the previous item and possibly with this item in, in financing uh, to get some sort of direction and understanding uh, from the MTC that, that you guys have been reaching out to them openly and in public sp spaces more recently. Uh, I thank you for that. I think we can handle ourselves pretty good financially with this item. Uh, good luck in your efforts to do so. I just thought I would mention these things at this time. Thank you. That concludes public comment. All right, we'll now close public comment for this item. And I see Director Jane has his hand raised. Go ahead, Director. Yeah, thank you, Takis. Um, I understand that there's going to be a joint uh, VTA-BART uh, committee meeting. Is that gonna be April 27th at 2 p.m.? Can you confirm that? And then yes, I, I do. To... I, that is the the meeting planned before, and the the VTA and BART, the dedicated directors, they're going to meet, and we're going to update them. That's BART and VTA stuff. Yes. Okay. And then I wanted to understand the two hundred million from the FTA. 
Is that in addition to the 9.2 that they're expecting this to be? Or is that just an advance that they're giving uh, us? It is an advancement. It's the annual appropriation. Now, FDA every year, as the president submits the budget up on the hill, they're going to put forward the money for the appropriations committee to vote. No, this is part of the 9.145. 9 okay. And then um, do we have, uh, can we get um, someone from the FTA to explain more carefully why their cost estimates are so much higher than ours? Oh, we have discussed that many times before. And we have, they, uh, 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 Director Jane, FDA did not do an estimate. FDA did a risk assessment. FDA looked at the microeconomic market conditions and did a risk assessment and said to us that we believe your project can go as high as 30%. From 7 billion, we were 6.9 to 9 something. I'm simplifying the number. And, uh, and they said, that's what our number, that's what we're willing to fund. And they committed and they got approval from the Congress to fund 25% of 9.1 billion. And my boss probably has better explanation than that. I, Carolyn. Yeah, I, I think what they do, what FTA does is they do a risk assessment on the project to, to make, and then um, based on that number that, they have because they want to make sure that the investment that they place on the project will be that will be deliver a project. They want to make sure that we have the funding to be able to do that. So we need a funding plan that matches the risk that they, the potential risk at a higher level. Now um, I could say on phase one they did that as well, um, and they had us add an additional 100 million on, and we're roughly about 100 million under budget. So as long as we manage within where we're at, then we're okay. Um, right now, we're in the process of really determining what is that cost estimate, that, the, what's the new cost estimate based on what we're seeing right now in the labor market, supply market, those types of things. We'll come back out with an estimate, but we'll put a risk assignment on that and contingency, and we'll see where that goes. But there'll be a risk refresh, but right now with the FTA, they're going to be stick, staying with, I think, the 9.14 at this point, particularly in the market right now that they're seeing across the country. They're saying they're they believe that the, the risk is there to go to 9.14. They're not saying the project will end up there. But that we should prepare for that and have a funding plan for that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hendricks. Hi, Takis. How's it going? So on the tunnel and track work contract package two, I think I heard you say you're anticipating to be able to come to the board um, next month. Yes. How are you know? Can you, is there a plan, if you're going to be reviewing proposed in, innovations, design, construction planning, and this is a pretty big package, is there going to be some work with us board members before the meeting, or, or how do we get in depth on this stuff? Because I can see this being more than a regular board meeting item. Um, that's a great question. Um, I will respond from the project manager's point of view, and Caroline can help me here. As you know, Director Hendricks, we started the evaluation of the summit back in December 12th. We have gone around the clock here for the last five months, I would say, because of the reasons you discussed. And you remember this contract is a progressive design build, has two stages. Stage one is the items I just said, and stage two, it will be the construction. Now, when the time comes and I have completed at the technical level, the list of all these innovations, I think it will be the time where we need to get together and take you through this. Now, I am a little bit sensitive here and Evelyn it will stop me if I get out of mark here. This innovation submitted by one contractor and they are still the property of that contractor. For that, we need to figure a way, how can we talk without to really expose the contractor in case at the end of the day, don't agree with him on what he's proposing. I mean, Caroline, how better I can say that? I think that's the most we can say right now. We're smack in the middle of the negotiations, so. I, 
so all I would say, so I appreciate all that is that I, I assume you're going to ask the board here to award a contract that's a pretty big contract. And I would just encourage us to be able to have, I, I don't know what the answer is, but you know, maybe there can be some kind of, I, I don't know what, but I could see review or question, even for us to review the documents is going to take a while. And it, it just seems a little bit bigger than kind of the standard, um, you know, board item. So yeah, I'll just yeah, like you are not going to award, I'm not going to ask you to award the whole contract. I will ask you to award stage one, which is the engineering services, engineering service, construction planning. I'm not going to ask you to award the $3 billion contract. Only the first stage. Okay, but but, it, but it's the pretty big, important foundational I stage, right? I understand. I understand. It, 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 understand. It, it's it's this. It's not trivial. Is all I'm trying to get to. Yes. And then on the system contract, the package one, I yes. would like to request that we do everything possible so that that does not go farther than Q4 2022, because I'd like to be able to vote on that. And if it goes farther than Q2 or Q4 2022. I don't get a vote, so yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's hope that stays on schedule. Yeah, I hear you. I agree with you. We're taking baby steps here, or slow steps if you like it, because there is a terrific connectivity between the tunnel contract and the systems. You remember the systems contractor will go inside the tunnel to hang his equipment. For that, before we finalize the tunnel contract, we are not going to put out the final RFP for the system. That's the reason we've been really going slowly here. Yes, I hear, I hear your point and take a note of it. Okay, thank you. And and hey, kudos to the team to keep it all moving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We we we're gonna do the best we can. You know that. Okay. Thank you, um, Director Licardo. Hey, thank you. Uh, congratulations to, to Carolyn and to Takas and the team for the $200 million allocated in the president's budget. Obviously a very significant uh, commitment. And, and I think quite importantly in this moment, uh, when we see this prevailing narrative in, in some sources in the media that somehow or another, uh, the FTA uh, or the US Department of Transportation or the federal government has lost confidence somehow in this project because of a report. And I've read the report myself, so I have a pretty good idea what it says. Uh, clearly, this dispels that narrative. Um, and I guess the question I have really is what we've done to communicate that fact, because, of course, we're still in the process of communicating externally with funding sources uh, in the state and the federal level. Uh, and we, we know that we're going to continue to need to do so. And it would be helpful, I think, for us to have a, a clearer record than what has been established so far in the media. And so I'm just wondering, other than sort of hitting the send button on a, on a press release, have we done any specific outreach to uh, reporters and editorial board members who have written about this to say, hey, by the way, uh, here, wanted you to see this, this $200 million commitment. Uh, clearly, as far as the federal government's concerned, this, this project is on track. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you allow me, I'll say one thing on your first statement. Okay. Whether or not this project has the, the confidence of USDOT, guarantee you that it does. And if today you and Caroline and the rest of the board call Secretary Putijek and tell him we're ready with our local fund, he will direct execution of the full funding agreement tomorrow. That, yeah. that is... I I'm confident of that, uh, Takis, and I agree. The problem is that's not the narrative being spelled out in the in the media, and my concern is is that we haven't is whether or not we have actually communicated uh, this most recent decision to specific members of the media so that they understand what is really going on. <laughs> so I, I do agree with you, Mayor, and it's one of the things I think we can do more of. Um, and I'm, I have actually had some conversations this week with our communications team, both from specifically from the project and the rest to try to, to um, really get the, get the point across that this is a very um, well regarded project, not just by the FTA, but you know, it has been the number one project in the region that people want to see built. 
and we sometimes get lost in all of that, but it still is the number one project in the region that people want to see built, is this connection um, of BART into San Jose. So I think it's something that we need to continue, or not even, I think we need, need to step it up. I agree. Okay, maybe we can talk more offline, Carolyn. I just, yeah, let's you know, do, yeah. look, if folks, like if folks need that. contact information, whatever, I'm happy to provide. I just feel like we need more than just hitting the send button. Um, it's, you know, I, I think you understand the point. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you, Takis, for uh, the presentation. It sounds like we're on track to get this project done in my lifetime. So mine too, I remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I, I remember. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. All right, this is an information item, so we don't need a motion. Uh, so last on the regular agenda is item 8.7, which is to receive an update from SB 1. 29 Joint Labor Management Committee. Uh, Brandy Childress, Chief of Staff, will provide the report. Yes, good evening, members of the board. On behalf of the committee, I'm here to provide a brief update on our ongoing efforts. Go to that next slide for me, Elaine. Um, we have made steady progress on many things, completing some major milestones in our first quarter of our work plan. Now formally named the 526 Resiliency Center, plans are underway to have a dedication ceremony in April alongside our partners at the county and the district attorney's office. Uh, our goal is to make this resource more publicly available as we approach the one year anniversary of May 26. Our employees have been utilizing the center, uh, but it's really for um, anyone who's been impacted by the event. And uh, we will be happy, our Employees still continue to use the counseling service at this center, working with our uh, up to seven now contracted clinicians. Uh, we also reported last month that our peer-to-peer -peer training program was being developed and it has, it's been established. The first round of training is going to start beginning this, uh, beginning this month. Of course, our ongoing efforts you see here on the slide, um, we're partnering, continuing to partner to provide mental health care services for employees and dedicated days off for uh, employees who need to take time when they should not be behind the wheel or in a cab or driving to work. So we're establishing those days. Um, an inclusive planning, engineering, and uh, operations effort to renovate BTA's Guadalupe Light Rail Division is also underway. It's a fairly large undertaking. Uh, we are starting with leveling building B, which is the former home to the wave power and signals uh, department and the maintenance crews. So uh, building demolition could start as early as the end of April. Uh, we're very mindful of what this could mean and uh, feel to people who are at the yard there now. Um, so we have been having meetings with employees to work through this process and we'll continue to do that. Um, along, uh, in addition to you know identifying additional funding strategies that are being considered for the overall work to, to reinvent Guadalupe. Um, and then lastly, on the next slide, show that. Uh, the, here's the updated timeline showing the organizational culture and climate transformation effort. Uh, a notice of intent to award the finalist, Deloitte Consulting, was made public on March 22nd. And we are in negotiations now. Uh, we are still on track to deliver this uh, final award recommendation to the board. We'll be bringing this to you on April 22nd at the workshop. And that's it. I can answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Brandy. Uh, we'll now take public comments. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? I do not see any hands. Oh, never mind. Blair, you may begin speaking when ready. Hi, just a very quick thought, uh, an idea. Uh, thank you to uh, Chairperson Jones for offering uh, that would take an hour for the closed session report. It helped out a lot. Thank you. Okay. That's the last public speaker. So we'll now close public comments on this item. Are there any questions from my colleagues? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, this is an information item, so we don't need a motion. So, All right, thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll, we're now on to item 
are there any items of concern or referral to the administration? And I'm looking for hands and I don't see any raised. Uh, on to announcements. I want to remind my colleagues that we have a workshop scheduled for April 22nd at 9 a.m. Are there any other announcements? I'm looking for hands. And I don't see any hands raised. And so we're now uh, on to item 9.3. And since we got all of the public comments in, in um, earlier and there weren't any outstanding speakers, so we're not gonna take public comments for this item. So that brings us to adjournment. And I wanna adjourn this meeting in memory of Denise Joy Patrick. So well, that's it. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. We will end the meeting for all now. Thank you, Daya.